This episode of Scandal Water contains adult themes and descriptions of violence. It is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Stories in scandal water. It's where you Hello, Ashley. Hello, Candy. We're back today to talk about another tragic but fascinating topic. Mm-hmm. In fact, I have been waiting to talk to you about this I one know. because this one feels really personal. Yeah. Really personal. Before I go any further, I should say this is one of those episodes where people should use discretion. There are some things we'll talk about that might be might be something a little too mature for kids. Sensitive We're, ears. Sensitive ears, exactly. But but it is very interesting. Of course, the theme is in our own backyards. Mm -hmm. All of our topics this month are going to be things that feel personal to us because they happen in Kentucky, in in the state where we live. But this one really feels like an in our own backyard because I learned about this case Mm -hmm. when I was actually performing in a theater, Little Colonel Theater Uh in Oldham County many years ago. Right. And this is the one that I knew a little bit about the other cases that we talked about Mm -hmm. but this one we decided that I would be completely cold on so I have no idea what this is that you're going to tell me about other than it happened at or around Little Colonel Playhouse. Yes okay so let me just kind of start with the way I learned about this. Okay. Many years ago one of my first times performing at the Little Colonel Playhouse which is a very quaint lovely theater but I was I think I I don't know if I finished early I just had a little time to kill and I was kind of walking around looking at photos on the wall. Mm-hmm. And I saw this this collage, this little picture display that had been put together. And it said it was created in memory of a woman named Dolores Lynch. And I remember, I think this man, Bill Baker, was there. Bill Baker, by the way, has been associated with the Little Colonel Playhouse since the 1970s. Oh, he's wow. been He's done it all. He's done the president's spot. He's handled the mailings. He actually, more recently, has become a playwright. He's oh, cool. Put, yes, he's written a few plays that they put on stage. So back at this time, Bill, he, kn- he knows everything. Everything. So he filled me in that this collage had been put together in honor of Dolores, who was a murder victim. Oh. Yes. And he shared with me that he knew her. He had performed on stage with her. I believe they performed together in the very first production that he ever did on the Little Colonel stage. And he shared that she had been murdered along with her adult daughter, Janie. And I remember just being appalled. I I was just taken aback that somebody who had performed in this beautiful, quaint little spot Mm -hmm. had been murdered. And then when he told me where the murder had occurred, my mother has since moved. But at that time, she lived in a place where I would pass by this house to go visit her without even realizing it. So talk about feeling personal. Yeah. So when we decided that we were going to do this theme in our own backyards, this case came back to me because it was so fascinating. Bill told me at that time that there had been a book written about this. It, I would call it a case because it actually extended beyond these two murders. We're going to get to that in a minute. It's it's big. Okay. But he told me there was a book called Bitter Blood, A True Story of Southern Family Pride, Madness, and Multiple Murder, oh. written by a man named Jerry Bledsoe. And I went out and read that book. You did back then or back recently? Then. Okay. back then and honestly it really is a disturbing case but it's it is fascinating mm-hmm. and so I ended up reading it again probably within the last five years okay so it's one that has captured my attention okay there's just so much to it but when Again, when we decided to do this episode, I reached out to Bill and I asked him if he would share just a couple of recollections 
just to add that personal touch. And so he kindly did so. Just a few little brief clips here and there. Let me share with you his first one. I had asked him to share with you guys how he first met Dolores and how she was involved with the Playhouse. And here's what he had to say. Dolores was in the first play I appeared in at the Little Colonel Theater, My Three Angels, in 1975. She seemed like a competent actress. She learned her lines and she did well on stage. Dolores took roles in plays. She served on the board of directors for one or two years, but primarily she appeared on stage at the Little Colonel Players. She had roles in nine different shows at Little Colonel before she was murdered. So she was even on the board. She was involved. Yeah. Yeah, This was somebody who was really, really into the theater. Mm -hmm. She was actually very active. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But another question I asked Bill was if he happened to know anything about her family members. Okay. Because, of course, that's something that plays a prominent role in what's about to take place. Take place. Mm -hmm. So here's what he said to that. I don't remember Dolores talking about her family much except for her husband. She made it no secret that it was a strange relationship. She called him a son bitch. I don't think I ever heard her say his name, to be honest with you. He would come home from work, go to the basement, watch TV and drink, and she took his dinner down there on a tray. The only other family member I ever met was Janie, who uh, lived with Dolores at the time. She was a pleasant woman. She appeared in a few plays at Little Colonel, which is where I saw her as well. I, I didn't know her well. So these family members do come up in the book. So just to kind of quickly just say a few more words to kind of establish some context. You heard Bill say that Dolores had a very odd relationship with Did her Did he say husband. strange or estranged? Very strained, I think is probably strained. what he said. Okay. But they okay. were okay. estranged. Okay, <laughs> they okay. were. Something that came out very strongly in the book. By the way, just let me go ahead and say this. The book to me was fascinating okay. and very well written. The writer, Jerry Bledsoe, was a reporter oh. and he knew how to write. Mm-hmm. He had, in fact, covered this case when it actually first happened and had this whole series of articles he'd written about it. Sounds it sounds like it really affected him. It did. And mm-hmm. then he went into uh, the research phase and researched I don't know how many years, probably two to three years, and then came out with the book. And this book ultimately leads to a TV miniseries. Oh. Yeah, so we're going to share all this. Oh. But but my point is, it's a well-written book. Okay. And one of the things that I liked is, you know, reporters, he was objective. He would tell things the way they were. So, of course, Dolores is very sympathetic in terms of what happens to her. But at the same time, he shared that she was a very quirky woman. Mm -hmm. Bill said that, that she was nice to him. She was solid on the stage, but he also <laughs> said she was a little quirky. Jerry Bledsoe wrote in the book that she was, quote, a blunt and outspoken woman who didn't care to tell people what she thought. And he shared, just to kind of establish how she was as a person, she was someone who might cause a scene if she oh. was irritated, she liked to control things. So if things didn't go her way, sometimes she could cause a scene. He gave an example. There was some controversy in her church at one point because they wanted to bring in this more modern prayer book, which she did not like. Okay. So she led a division in the church and then ultimately left to go someplace where they had a prayer book that she liked. She was a person who, she had lots of friends. She also was known to be... You either liked her or you didn't like her, yes. it sounds like. Yes, okay. and the situation with her husband had gotten to a point they lived together in this home before he passed at the time of the murders he had passed just less than a year before i thought you were going to tell me that he's the one that perpetrated it oh no he had passed away before the murders and they were at such a i guess a hostile point of their relationship that it really was the way bill described in his little audio clip there the husband lived downstairs she she lived lived upstairs upstairs. they tried not to cross paths she was this the father of janie yes okay and he's also the father of an, a, the brother, Janie's brother, Tom, who's going to come into the story in just a bit. Okay. Okay. So just kind of introducing you to Dolores just a bit. Just one more clip from Bill, and then I'm going to kind of get into what happened. But because it's so personal to me, I thought it might be interesting to ask Bill, how did this affect people in this area mm-hmm. when they heard about mm-hmm. these murders of, of people they knew, they people knew. that they were going to church with, on stage with. So here's his last clip. Well, the folks at Little Colonel were pretty upset about the murders as well as everyone else in town. Uh, to commemorate Dolores, a framed poster with photos of her appearing on stage in our plays and a listing of her roles that uh, she performed in at Little Colonel 
was placed in our lobby area for many years. This may seem a little disjointed, but what I was trying to do was kind of bring you into the story the way I came into yeah. the story. This so you is, heard about it through Bill. I heard about it through Bill, and I basically just kind of had this background. But what he did share with me was a little more about the murders themselves. And by the way, this case, Jerry Bledsoe, the author of the book, is quoted as saying, this remains the most bizarre criminal case in American history. What? There is nothing to match this anywhere. You have all the elements, good families, money, bombs, shootouts. What in the world? I know. But here's how I learned about it. Okay. I'm going to start with these two murders. On Tuesday, July 24th, 1984, a friend of Dolores, her last name is Lynch, by the way, Dolores Lynch. This friend was Susan Reed. She pulls up into Dolores's driveway. Now, Dolores is wealthy. Her husband had a great job. I think he was an executive for GE. And so he had passed away and she's still obviously in this home, which has 14 rooms, four baths. It's located on four acres, kind of outside of Prospect, Kentucky. This is 1984. They had a panic button in a closet. They had telephones in almost every room. Do you realize that was 40 years ago or what, 39 years ago, two days ago? Because wow. we're recording this on July 26th. Oh, I did not put that together. Uh -huh. that is you so said July 24th, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So 84. So next mm -hmm. year would be the 40th anniversary. That is right. Wow. Well, Dolores had normally lived with just her husband. And then when he passed away, she was alone. But it just so happened that her daughter, Janie Lynch, who was 39, had moved back in in temporarily because Janie had actually tried several different careers. She'd never been married. She'd been, she's very cute, very bubbly. Everybody liked her. I think she'd been engaged several times, but she'd never gone through with a marriage. Okay. And she had gone down different career paths and she had changed her mind and decided she was going to go into dentistry. She had just finished, I believe, dental school and she had moved back in with her mom for a bit while she was trying to figure out what am I doing next? Am I going to okay. get an apartment? Janie is with her mom at this time. Now, when Susan pulls up into this drive, way, she's concerned because normally she and Dolores would go to church together, but she'd been sick on Sunday. So she had not seen Dolores on Sunday. And then th these are best friends. Susan had been sick. Susan had been okay. sick. Mm -hmm. And so she tried to call Dolores probably Sunday night, but she definitely tried to call her on Monday and she wasn't getting hold of her. And mm -hmm. now it's Tuesday. She tried to call her, couldn't get hold of her. So she decided she's going to go in person and she's going to check on her. And this is really unusual. They talk every day. Mm -hmm. So when she pulls up into the driveway, she comes all the way up to where there's kind of this parking area for the vehicles to land. And this is when she realizes that something's wrong. There is a episode, it's a, a series called Snapped Killer Couples. And there was a specific episode on these murders. To be honest, parts of it were fictionalized. They okay. would go into the mind of one of the characters. And, and I know from reading all the different articles and books that we didn't know this person's perspective. So I know they fictionalized yeah. pieces of it. But what I loved about it was they had interviews with different people who were involved with the case, one of them being the author. So I have a couple of audio clips from Jerry Bledsoe, which come directly from I want to credit my source, Oxygen's Snapped Killer couples. Here's, killer couples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's the first one. She saw this thing of blood down the driveway. And then she looked up there and there was Dolores' body lying by the garage door. So that was Jerry Bledsoe's voice explaining how Susan saw the blood and saw Dolores' body laying outside the garage. She saw her laying outside the garage and nobody, did she not have neighbors? She was up her house, she had four acres. Oh. So you had a driveway that went up oh. and this was, this was an affluent home. Okay. Yeah. So Susan immediately. How horrifying for oh, Susan. I know. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh. Well, she jumps in her car. She drives four miles back to the office where she worked. And because you don't no have cell, cell phones, phones. Right. No she cell needed, phones. She needed to call mm -hmm. for help. So the police arrive pretty quickly. And when they do, they find 68-year-old Dolores laying on her side. She is wearing the clothes that she had worn to church on Sunday. Oh, so she did go to church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Beside her were her purse a white sweater that she'd been carrying and there was a copy of the newspaper from Sunday that she had picked up from the end of her drive. Wow, she hadn't even made it back in the house from church. Right, it was as oh. she was trying to get in. Oh. She had been shot in the back and oh. through the top of her head. Oh. Now inside they found her two dogs who were safe, though you could tell they'd not been fed, fed in a while. But then in the home 
they, they reported this different ways. Some said it was a sunroom. Some said it was a bedroom. But in one of the rooms, they found Janie. She was wearing shorts and a tank top. She had curlers in her hair, and she was laying face down. She had been shot once in the back and once in the neck at the base of her skull. Ah. And what it was clear from the path, you know, that she had taken that she had been trying to run from oh. her killer. She had been trying to get to telephones, but you could tell she was being chased. At one point, she had tried to trigger the panic alarm that was in the closet but then ultimately she had gotten trapped in this room where she had been killed oh that's horrid yes absolutely awful so the house was in some disarray and on the purse is there and there's nothing missing from her purse right Mm. see on first glance you would think it was a robbery but the investigators very quickly decided no it wasn't this was staged to look like a robbery because almost nothing of value had been taken right and it looked like a professional hit because the shots had come from what appeared to be a high-powered assault rifle and there were no shells left at the scene which Mm. is something that shows there's some professionalism Mm -hmm. to it so these are the murders that we've been talking about. So some sweet church lady who just likes to act in a community theater has been possibly professionally mm-hmm. murdered. Right. And Along her daughter. with her 39-year-old daughter who had no enemies. Oh my gosh. Yes. Now, Tom Lynch, son of Dolores, brother of Janie, lived in Albuquerque and he would learn of the devastating news that he had lost both his mother and his sister through a phone call. Golly, and his dad's already gone a year his before. His dad was gone, exactly. So this brings us back. That's I wanted to kind of start okay. with the murders that came to my attention. Okay. And now we're going to go back to the beginning of the story. Okay. Okay, we're going to go back and meet the key players. Okay, because you said snapped couples. Killer couples. Killer couples. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Do you have any thoughts you want to... I was... Well, either Janie had a husband and her... No, she wasn't married. So she either Janie had a disgruntled paramour or Dolores had found somebody else. But then killer couples? So does that mean that there was two people that killed them? Well, y- yes. Co- uh, Ish? A couple that's involved in murders is what you would... S- yeah. there, it's a... It's a couple that has committed the murder Mm -hmm. okay so it doesn't have anything to do with who those two ladies were involved with it's a couple that did this okay that's my thinking right now yes all right so first important person we need to meet we're going to start with Susie Newsom. Susie was born on Christmas Eve of 1946 to Bob who was an executive at RJ Reynolds and Florence who was a teacher. She was the first of the two children they would have. This is another wealthy couple mainly because of his income. Mm -hmm. They raised Susie in Winston Salem North Carolina and Susie's family was not just affluent they had status behind them. It was it was kind of a, a very accomplished family. She was delivered by her uncle, who was a doctor named Fred Klenner. So Fred was married to the sister of mom Florence. Susie's mom is Florence. Florence has one sister married to a doctor. Okay. Okay. He, Kleiner or Kling- Klenner? Klenner. Klenner. Uncle Fred is the one who delivered Susie. And Susie is named after one of the other aunts, one, another one of Florence's sister, who is Susie Sharp, who would become the first female North Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice. Okay, so that's big. Very big. Okay. This woman was like one of the most influential people in the state, according to some different... Got some power. Magazines. Yes, exactly. Lots of influence. Because... We had two Susies in the family. People started calling young Susie, Susie Q. Okay. And then Susie called her aunt, Susu, Aunt Susu. And so everybody started calling the aunt, Aunt Susu. So if that okay. helps us distinguish, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. But basically, Susie and her aunt, this judge, Susie Sharp, they're very close. Okay. Okay. Now, Susie is bright, she's beautiful, and by all accounts, very spoiled. Uh. Jerry Bledsoe, in one of his articles, I was not able to read the book again. I didn't have time. So what I was able to find was his original series of articles from back when this all first happened. Okay. And I reread all of those. Okay. But he speculated that one of the contributing factors to why Susie was spoiled from the get-go was that she was born with a heart murmur. And according uh. to what he was told, this uncle, Uncle Fred Klenner, had instructed Susie's parents don't let her cry and so for like the first year of her life 
they did everything on earth to keep this child from ever crying. And so she was set up. She had another health scare. Everybody doted on this girl. Everybody. So she's spoiled beyond. Beyond. Mm. In fact, she lived a life of privilege. That was a term that we heard quite a bit. And Jerry Bledsoe said she knew how to use her charm to get Mm. what she wanted, but she also knew how to use her temper. In Mm. fact, her tantrums reportedly got so fierce when she was a child that sometimes there was no way to calm her down except for her mom to throw water on her oh, to like get her attention because she would get so out of control. So as she moved through school, Susie continued to grow into an attractive, smart woman who excelled at school and the activities, but she didn't have a lot of close friends. Because she's so spoiled. Nobody wants to be her friend. But well, first of all, she's privileged yeah. and you can't identify with that. And then she's rotten. I mean, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to guess that some I'm making some <laughs> deep assumptions. And also I'm a little, I'm, I'm presuppositioning that she's <laughs> one half of this snapped couple. So I'm already mad at her. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, you, you may not be too far off. Yeah. I got no, I got no love for Susie Q. Right. And she keeps getting special attention from everybody, including, you know, judge aunt Susu. There's Susie. Okay. Now when she gets to Wake Forest University, Susie meets a handsome basketball player named Tom Lynch. That's the brother. That is the brother. Okay. Okay. Now, like Susie, he is from... Is this... Tom the other half of the snapped couple? I'm not telling you anything. Oh, I, he was in Albuquerque. Tom, dang it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, like Susie, we've already said, he's got this affluent family, and he's appealing to her. He's pre-med. Susie likes the thought of a guy who's going to be a doctor. Now, Tom is two years younger, but they connect. One of the things that they pointed out was, you know, she's the more type A personality, of course. And the fact that he's laid back actually helps them, Mm -hmm. right? But something else that was said was that in some ways it might have been appealing to her because she could control him. Most likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, from the very first meeting between Susie and Tom's mother, Dolores. Sparks are flying. Oh, goodness. It might be a full-blown fire. Okay. All right. Jerry Bledsoe had a little comment to make about this as well. So I'll play you one more little audio clip. Tom's mother was just like Susie. She was a total controller. Everything had to go her way. And from the time they met, they were just about enemies of each other. If you could hear Jerry Bledsoe, he was saying they just... Avowed. They were avowed mm-hmm. enemies. Absolutely. And in fact, Dolores tried to convince Tom that he should not propose to Susie, that they would not be a good couple. Mm-hmm. But he did marry her in June of 1970. Although literally they had a fight on her wedding day apparently Janie was in the wedding she was a bridesmaid and Susie had a problem with Janie's dress for some reason you know she spoke out against it that made Dolores furious and so the two of them had words on the wedding day and even in some of the pictures they talked about how you could see the tension after the wedding Tom at some point changed his career plans he had decided rather than be a doctor he wanted to be a dentist and so he was accepted in to dental school at the University of Kentucky, and that's where they went. His parents are helping pay for things, by the way, so I believe they funded his schooling. But despite that fact, and despite the fact that Tom's parents are living only about 90 minutes away from this dental school, Susie and Tom only visited his parents one time in the four years that they were there. Mm. So you can tell they are not getting along. Mm -hmm. Tom joined the Naval Reserve in 1974, and he was assigned to train at Paris Island which led the couple to Buford, South Carolina. Now, she likes this place a lot better. She was not a fan of Lexington, but Susie liked South Carolina. It was a little bit more in keeping with the kind of... Affluence that she's mm -hmm, wanting. Yeah, exactly. In August, they had their first child, John. But here, here you go. Here's how this relationship is. Dolores and Janie arrive because they want to see this baby. Yeah. Susie doesn't let them in the house. Uh. They even have an extra guest bedroom. Susie and Tom do. Susie tells Dolores, you guys go get a hotel room and call to make an appointment to come see the baby. Oh. Yeah, this is where they stand. So reportedly, Dolores did get to see the baby, but the visit was short and it wasn't pleasant and she left in tears. Mm. Susie becomes pregnant with a second child very soon after. And when Jim is born, Dolores doesn't even see that baby for a full year. Oh. So this is not a close relationship at all. Well, in 1976, Tom goes ahead and gets out of the Navy. He was just in a short program there. And he wanted to go to Albuquerque to start his dental practice. He moves the family. 
He loves it there. Susie hates it. Now, Jerry Bledsoe speculates in his articles, well, actually, some of the friends that were around them at the time speculate that it seemed to them Susie didn't feel like Albuquerque was cultured enough for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She really liked how important her family was back home in North Carolina. Right. And she didn't want to be in a place where she didn't have any social prominence. Right. People didn't know her name. She didn't have the connections. In fact, there was a couple they knew from college who also moved to Albuquerque, and they noticed that during the three years that Susie and Tom were together in New Mexico, Susie became increasingly more unhappy, more distant. She and Tom started fighting more. She would become angry and bitter to the point that she would make nasty remarks about Tom in front of his friends or sometimes about his friends in their presence. And then they stopped coming around her. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of driving everyone away. Mm -hmm. And then there was another neighbor couple who had befriended the Lynches when they first got there. Hank and Irene were their names. And Susie would tell Irene in particular how unhappy she was and how much she wanted to move back home. But they reported some other concerns. They heard heard and saw things that made them worry that Susie was mistreating the boys. Oh no. Just to give a couple of examples, at one point Irene saw John with some marks on his face and she asked him what happened and he said he fell down. But Susie jumps in and says, "He didn't fall down. I slapped him." <sighs> and Irene is shocked and she comments to Susie, "Well, you must have hit him hard." To which Susie says, "I did. I knocked him across the room." Like she's proud of it. Oh, like she thinks no. there's nothing wrong with this. And then there was another point where Jim was hospitalized for two days to the point it looked suspicious, and the hospital staff questioned them about child abuse. Oh. But the neighbors never felt comfortable telling Tom. Tom didn't believe his... And by the way, he's gone a lot. He's trying to start his dental practice. He's not in the home very much. He doesn't believe his wife would be doing this. Basically, nothing happens. Okay. Okay. Well, it wasn't long after this, in July of 1979, that Susie said she was taking the boys home to North Carolina to visit her grandfather, who everybody called... Papa, because he was really, really sick. Does she not come back? She does not. Uh, Yeah. In fact, it wasn't long after she got back to North Carolina that she called to say, I'm not doing it. Yeah. So she gets some advice from her Aunt Susu about how to handle custody and all these different things. And she acquires a lawyer to help draw up a separation agreement. And by the end of October, Tom and Susie had both signed this separation agreement. And Tom did agree to let her have full custody of the boys, which is something they said that back in that time period was, was very common yeah. um, and he doesn't believe that anything bad is happening to the kids anyway right but he was concerned about custody he definitely wanted i mean a, an agreement that would let him see his boys yeah yeah mm-hmm. and by this time he's also starting to date his dental assistant kathy okay. which Susie is furious about but she doesn't well of course she, that makes sense she doesn't want him but she doesn't want anybody else to have him either honestly there was something in one of the articles that said that at this point they thought she did want him she just wanted to control the narrative oh. she wanted him back in north oh, carolina so she thought if i threaten to leave you you'll come back, you'll come back and, he and it'll go my way gotcha yeah and that would be embarrassing back in that time it would have been extremely humiliating for her to have gone through a divorce probably like embarrassment to the family you think well i mean i guess it was more unusual back in 1980 whatever i guess this was 79 yeah Yeah. 79 yeah it probably was on the other hand i think so much it was her yeah status control Mm -hmm. she's not getting her way this was an interesting little thing Susie suddenly decided that she was wanting to study mandarin after christmas she took the boys and her plan was to spend a year in taiwan teaching english while studying the language at a very deep level but she quickly decided she was having to like share an apartment with this other family she didn't like the pollution she didn't like sharing an apartment yeah. she didn't like the small space she came back pretty quickly they they got sick while they were there and so by the time she came back after only like six months she's feeling pretty sickly feeling a little defeated two very important things happen when she comes back she moves in with her parents okay? okay first thing is not long after she gets back she learns that tom has filed for divorce in new mexico okay. and this is going to be the start of a very long and very ugly custody battle she's also furious that he filed in new mexico 
because everybody thinks that had the filing happened in North Carolina, this is where her whole aunt family is and, and her, her aunt whole family is strings. Exactly. Okay. This makes her furious and she's afraid he's setting things up so he can get her, you know, her kids. And at this point, by the way, by 1981, when the legal battle starts really heating up, Tom has not seen his boys in two years. Mm. Like he's getting pretty desperate to see mm-hmm. his kids. Mm-hmm. So her lawyer is trying to get the jurisdiction changed so that they can do all this in North Carolina. Ultimately, a New Mexico judge rules that they were going to settle the property and the divorce matters in New Mexico, but that visitation matters would be settled in North Carolina, Why? which is a win for Susie. Oh. Yeah. Tom Tom would later say he's very bitter about this even in in the most recent interviews I saw which was like 2015 he's still bitter about how this all played out he said he got hometowned and in some ways he was penalized by the decisions that were made in the North Carolina courts yeah but just to kind of give you a couple of examples one of his chief complaints was how little time he got with the boys 35 days in the summer that was his summer visitation seven days at Christmas and seven days at spring break every other year oh also because they live so far apart and the boys would have to fly and they were so young, they had this accompaniment stipulation that said the boys, basically you had to get them on a plane and off the plane. So if there was any kind of like a layover, they didn't want the boys doing that by yeah. themselves. Yeah. For example, Susie might have to fly to Atlanta with the boys, put them on a direct flight from Atlanta to where Tom was in New Mexico, and then Susie fly back. Mm-hmm. Tom would have to pay for all travel. Ah. All travel. He's not making that much money. But on top of this, he has to pay alimony and child support. His parents would end up having to help him a lot because of what happened with his settlements, yeah. with his divorce, his alimony, his visitation Poor situation. Tom. Tom and Susie were officially divorced in December of 1982. And that was the first thing I told you that happened. The second thing that happens after Susie comes back is because she's kind of sickly, her family, I think it was her mother, suggested she go visit her uncle, Dr. Fred Klenner, same one who had delivered her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Fred Klenner is a doctor, and he is very, very eccentric and odd. Um, He's the one that told him that, that she couldn't let that, don't let her cry. Yes. He was a man who many people thought was a quack. And then on the other hand, you had some many patients who absolutely thought he walked on water. Like, oh, yeah, because that's a big difference. he was racist. He had very questionable medical practices. One of his things was vitamins. He used vitamins to treat certain things like MS or polio. And once or twice, he did something that seemed to work and he would get like in journals and he would get a name behind him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this man was giving out these vitamins for everything. And sometimes he was the one who would diagnose that you have MS and then he would magically cure you of your MS by giving you the vitamins. He was a very controversial kind of guy, Mm -hmm. very odd duck. Susie goes to him. He starts her on a vitamin treatment. And while she's there at the clinic and and around her doctor, Dr. Klenner, her uncle, she comes back in contact with her cousin, Fritz Klenner. The way you said that makes me think, now he's the other half of the snapped couple. Yeah. Oh, gosh. All right. Fritz. Doctor's son? Yes. Okay. First cousin. First cousin first cousin her first cousin yeah her mom is florence florence's sister is annie and this is annie's son with fred okay okay so fritz is six years younger than Susie. he's tall dark very fit he is also a survivalist who hero worships his father and has grown up to share Fred's racist beliefs and love of guns. In school, he was known, people who wear this and it's perfectly fine, but this was in in the 1970s and it was an indication of his beliefs about doomsday and survivalists that he would wear military style clothing all the time. Uh It was his thing. And then he also would sometimes, for example, draw Nazi symbols on his notebook. In college, he focused on pre-med And Jerry Bledsoe was quoted in one of his articles as saying, Fritz had begun to live a life of fantasy. Fritz would tell people stories all the time. 
For example, he would tell them, and I do believe he carried a pistol on campus, but he would say he did that because he was an undercover narcotics agent. Or he would tell other people, I'm, uh, you know, undergoing secret military training in Georgia. I'm learning how to do explosives. One time he bragged that he had been attacked by a group of black men and had fought them off single-handedly using his combat skills. Mm. Like he was telling stories all the time mm -hmm. and most of them involved him being a hero a hero and also having this really strong military background and military training so Susie comes into the situation and goes this is a mind I can control and or I kind of feed into your weird yeah. crazy fantasies yeah. so after four years Fritz had still not graduated he was just a few credits short so he enrolled in a summer session in a fall class and he tells his family it comes home at Christmas you know I've graduated the diploma is going to be mailed and his dad is very proud of him his dad was very controlling as well mm -hmm. he was a very exacting type of man fritz had all along been kind of volunteering to help out in the clinic because he was pre-med but now he's graduated his father's starting to let him take a more active role in the clinic oh, but i'm feeling like he hasn't graduated. he has not graduated okay they think he has he now tells them that he is starting medical school at duke now this is where fred Klenner had graduated from so he is super proud that his son is going to go to duke as well and gotten mm -hmm. into medical school so he's supporting this and I'm sure he's financially supporting this and Fritz starts a pattern of helping out at his father's clinic every weekend like Friday through Sunday and then doing class or he tells them he's doing rounds as well that's part of what he's doing with this medical training Monday through Thursday and he's living there near his campus during that time of the week what we know is that he's he's not He's not doing any of that, okay? During his time that he was supposed to be attending classes, he hung out a lot with different people, such as he made friends with these guys who would work on his car, these mechanics. A lot of times he knew that they would work at night in one of the guy's garages and he started showing up. And these fellas later would report in an interview that Fritz would often wear a white lab coat. He would tell them he was a doctor yeah. at Duke. He carried around a doctor's satchel that had vitamins, syringes. He would offer all the time, let me give you some vitamins. Let me give you a shot. Oh, no, no, to no. To take care of the stress. And they Do not take a shot from a random man with a satchel. Right? No. They secretly called him Dr. Crazy. Yeah. During this time at Duke, he also had a short marriage that ended in a divorce, mainly due to infidelities. But one of the women that he was dating on the side later said that he told her that he was a military operative who was sometimes sent on secret missions this was something he told a lot of different people that he was somehow involved in intelligence and had to go on dangerous covert missions some of his other deceptions he would say that he had some very serious illness one time it was stomach cancer but his dad healed him mm. through his treatments mm -hmm. okay he also frequently would tell of saving his dad dad's life so one time he would hang out at this one gun shop a lot because he collected so many guns and so he kind of became friends with the owner so one time he shows up and he's got scratches all over his chest and his arm and his story was somebody had tried to kill his father by taking a shot at him but Fritz had saved his father's life by pushing him out of the way but in the process had gotten grazed by a bullet mm -hmm. so these are the types of things so he's just Fritz... wild stories all over the place wow yes are so... people believing him yes really <laughs> Well, I mean, some people see through it, but so many people Believed believe him. him. Believe him, yes. He must be telling it in a way that, that makes it sound like he believes it. It made you wonder. Uh -huh. I, I do think I do think he did. Hmm. That's my just a personal opinion. Well, another reason for the divorce was in addition to finding out that he was having these affairs on the side, his wife discovered that he was not even a she thought he was attending Duke, but she found out He's that, not. Right. And she ends up along with one of the women that the two of them hooked up because they realized they were both caught up in this yeah. deception and they called and told Fritz's father that he's he's not even in middle, medical school but ultimately dad just let him keep working in his clinic treating people as though he's a doctor and he's wearing a doctor's coat they're calling him the young Dr. Klenner and he's doing things like removing moles for people Hi. or yes in fact when his father took seriously ill like he ran the clinic while his oh. dad was in the hospital Okay, now we've introduced you <laughs> to the crazy to couple. All right, let's go back to Susie. When the two of them reconnect, they have a very close friendship that quickly develops into a romance. Yeah. Nobody wants to believe it, especially the family. Yeah. They're in denial. But remember, she's in her parents' house and they start to notice not only is Fritz coming over an awful lot, but once or twice they're like, it's the next morning. Why is he still here? Yeah. And then they learned 
from somebody that every now and then they would be gone for like a weekend to visit Florence's mom and they learned that he would stay in their house while they were gone and so they were like okay something's going on between this couple and Fritz's mom did not believe it because Florence went to her sister Annie and said I'm afraid something's happening yeah. between our kids yeah and her sister was like oh no 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 you your mind's in the gutter this is not you know she was in denial but Florence is very very disturbed she and, and her husband is too but it's Florence who confronts Susie and says you guys have to stop you know this isn't right and and you know I don't want this happening in my home mm -hmm. Susie is enraged they have words different times and finally a confrontation in early 1983 causes Susie to become so angry she moves out and she and her mother are estranged now like she won't even talk to her mom she won't see her because she tried to tell her what to do mm -hmm. and told her no mm -hmm. and in fact she kind of cut off most of her family Aunt Susu had to work really hard to even see her and try to connect but in the meantime Susie and Fritz are getting super close and Susie and the boys are falling right into Fritz's world of survivalist plans, guns, taking vitamins, like mm -hmm. just huge amounts of mm -hmm. daily vitamins, all of it. And you could tell Susie is believing some of these things because she's telling people at different times she's very afraid that Tom is going to try to get the boys and just, she's concerned because, you know, he's involved with the mob. Or Tom is involved with the mob? Uh-huh. Okay. And she tells him she knows this because she knows somebody in the CIA who told her that. Which would be Fritz. Which would be Fritz. Okay. The word paranoia was used a lot yeah, in yeah. these articles. Both of them are getting totally Paranoid. drawn into this deep paranoia. Mm -hmm. So there were lots and lots of concerns and stories about the dangers of Tom being with the boys. This was something that was prevalent in Susie's mind and Fritz would feed, feed it. into it. Mm -hmm. This is heartbreaking, but being parented by Susie and Fritz, who, by the way, was kind of like a father figure to them now. They are around him all the time. Do they know that they're cousins, I wonder? Oh, the boys are young. They're probably, they don't know. No, I don't think they have a clue. They, okay. They've been told to call Fritz Papa, uh, and, and they're around him all the time. Yeah. So, you know, he's talking to them about guns, and, yeah. you know, he's influencing them a lot. To the point that in 1983, when the boys show up for their summer visit with Tom... Tom is concerned. He has not seen his boys. I mean, like Susie cuts him off. Like if he mails a letter, they don't get it. Oh. They're not allowed to communicate with him. He uh, somehow manages to call them now and then. But like if he sends a gift, nope. They don't get it. Like he is cut off from them except for what is very rigidly controlled by oh, their custody agreement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So when they show up, he's like concerned. They seem dirty. They've come with just mounds of vitamins. And he tells them, you know, you don't have to take those. And they're concerned that mom might find out that they didn't take them and they would get in serious trouble. Mm. He says they don't look like they've been taken care of, like their teeth are plaque encrusted. They're withdrawn. They won't hardly speak. Yeah. If one of them starts to say something about what's happening in their in their home, the other one will nudge them like, shut up, don't talk. Oh, like these boys are traumatized. He is concerned about them. And so as the summer goes on, they start to warm up. He, you know, he throws the vitamins away and they're taking them on outings and he takes them to visit his parents. Okay. And Dolores is thrilled to see her boys to the point to where like, she's just making it a party. She, she rents a hotel for a couple <laughs> of nights so they can play in the pool. Like, mm -hmm. so they are having this great time the boys by the time the visit's over they are just like boys again mm -hmm. and Dolores even tells Tom she's she advocates a lot they're paying for things right? right and she's in his business a lot in fact Tom's divorce papers after her murder would be found in her house mm. so she tells Tom you need to push for more visitation. He already believes that. And she goes kind of, you know, she likes to control things. She personally speaks to Tom's lawyer to say, you need to help him do this. Mm -hmm. And she also says, I think I should get some visitation rights as a grandmother. And she speaks to a lawyer about that. By the time the boys visit the following summer, 1984, things have progressed. Susie and Fritz are closer than ever. He's like a second father. Fritz is like a second father to these kids. And it is during the summer visit in 1984 that Tom receives a phone call telling him that his mother and his sister have been murdered. It was actually close to the end of the time for his summer visits with the boys to be over per their custody agreement. And he had planned to take the kids to see his mom within days. Yeah. And, but 
she's murdered. He calls Susie. He's devastated. He says, can I keep the boys longer? You know, I'm grieving. I need them. And she says, no, no. Um, you know, I've got a camping trip planned. I can't change it. They need, they have to come back. Mm -hmm. Just to state the obvious, Tom was a suspect because with his dad already gone, his mother and his sister gone, he's now in a position to inherit... A lot of money. Yeah, yeah, well over a million and probably, I have no idea the actual figure, but yes, a lot of money. But they investigate, they give him a couple of polygraphs, he's clean. He's clearly in in New Mexico the entire time. Yes, he was with with his wife and the boys camping. Oh, he did marry the dental assistant? Yes, they, they were married, yes. Okay. Now, one hopeful thing for Tom that happened was Susie's parents, Bob and Florence, reached out and sent condolences to him mm. about the loss of his Dolores and Janie. And he took the opportunity to start a conversation. He started saying, I'm really concerned about these boys. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned about their care, how they're acting. I believe they need a father. I need they, I think they need to see me more often. I want to mm-hmm. be in their lives. And they agree. Oh, good. Yeah. Tom's goal is he and his lawyer are going to try to push for more time with the boys. They want to extend the visits. They want more more time with the boys. And Bob Newsom, who is actually, remember, Susie's father, that he agrees to testify on behalf of Tom at this hearing that's going to come up where they're going to try to settle this issue of custody. I suddenly have a feeling of dread. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Okay. Trial was coming up, but before it happened, on May 19th of 1985, there were three more murders. Good. Knew you were going to say something like that. In Winston-Salem. Is it her parents? It is. And her grandmother. (sighs) Bob Newsom and his wife, Florence... We're visiting Bob. I said earlier, and let me correct that. It's actually Bob's mom that they would often visit. They were visiting Bob's mother, Hattie. Everybody called her Nana. Remember when I mentioned Papa earlier? Nana and Papa were a couple. Papa had passed away now. So Nana's by herself in this big house. And so at this time, Bob and Florence had decided they were going to go live with Nana. And they were remodeling her home. And they were going to go live with her. And then they were going to go ahead and, and let their son, Rob, and his family take the house they were currently living in. But the renovations weren't done yet. So it was very common. They would go up on the weekends, check on their renovations stay with Nana and then come back but this particular weekend they didn't come back when they were supposed to and their son Rob he becomes concerned just as an interesting side note they're in an affluent neighborhood Maya Angelou lives is like a neighbor of of Nana I mean this is where they live okay Rob calls this couple that's friends that live pretty close to his grandmother's house. And he says, will you go check, you know, check and make sure everything's okay. It's Dr. Sutton and his wife, Katie. Dr. Sutton actually treats Nana for something. Yeah. So Dr. Sutton and his wife go over to the house and they went to the back door that the family always used because they know, you Uh know, and they see that the glass in the storm door Uh has been broken Uh and there are some pieces of glass laying on the step. And Dr. Sutton immediately commented, something bad Uh has happened here. So he peeked into the window and through the sheer curtains he could see nana laying on a couch with an afghan pulled up to her chest she had on a nightgown and she looked like she was sleeping but then he saw florence lying on the floor on her right side facing the tv and it just looked wrong something about her positioning just looked really odd and then he saw the blood oh gosh he later said he knew something awful had happened and then it suddenly hit him that the killer might still be in the mm-hmm. house so he and Katie quickly Hightail left other, yeah, yeah and they they went across the street to a neighbor's house and called 911 and when the police arrived they found 55 year old Bob he was dead. He was her the... own parents and grandma and her grandmother. Is Tom okay? Did she get Tom too? Oh, gosh. do you want me? No, don't. Okay, just okay. tell your story. Right. So when the police arrived, they just found Bob, who was fifty-five. He was lying on his side in a hallway, not too far from the back door. He had been shot five times: oh my gosh. three in the abdomen, once in the forearm, once in the head. Nana had been shot three times. Once what did she... Nana ever do? Nothing. <sighs> 
One shot had just grazed the left side of her head. The other two had hit her in the lower right side and the right temple. And she, oh my gosh, this is heartbreaking. She had her hands folded together under her chin and it looked like she might have been praying. Oh my gosh. And then 56-year-old Florence was the one who was really treated the most brutally not only had she been shot in the chest and the head, but she'd been stabbed multiple oh times in the back and neck and her throat had been cut. Mm. It, they said it looked like somebody had tried to take off her wedding ring because it was bent and her finger was cut beneath it and her diamond engagement ring was missing. And the police would observe this seemed very personal. The fact that she was stabbed and had Susie her did that cut. part, if I had to guess. Well, they also said it didn't seem like a robbery because so many things of value were in plain sight Mm -hmm. that were just left. So the police, of course, are questioning everybody they would normally question. And when they start asking Rob some questions, almost as an afterthought, he says something about how just bizarre it was that his sister Susie's ex-mother and ex-sister-in-law had been murdered less than a year before. So that was still unsolved, I assume. It was. Okay. It was. It was. In fact, they had kind of gone cold on that. Okay. Yeah, because after they had eliminated all their leads and they kind of eliminated Tom, they they, were, they didn't know. They were kind of stuck. Okay. Yes. I'm glad you asked that question. I meant to bring that out. Rob would later say that it was when he was questioned by the police and they asked him one question in particular. They said, do you know anybody who's got a thing for guns? And, and Rob is her... Her brother. Brother. Okay. okay. brother. Yeah, yeah. And he said it hit him. Just he like a ton like of bricks. Fritz. Yeah. Fritz. Tom also immediately saw the connection between the murders when he learned about what had happened and he called the investigators to say you need to check on this guy Fritz. Yeah. But as the police were following their normal procedures one of the first people of course they also went to after Rob was Susie and they noticed how bizarre it was. She showed absolutely no grief. Yeah. None. None. And when they're in the home talking to Susie, Fritz is there. I think by this time he's living in the apartment with Susie and the boys. And just the way he's his appearance, the way he's dressed, the weapons, all these things are kind of raising more red flags. Mm -hmm. They go and they talk to Fritz's mother, Annie, as well. And without meaning to, because she's just innocent, she believes her son is is innocent. But she shares some things that actually continue to affirm to these detectives something is off. So for example, she talks about her son's secret government work Mm. and you know tells them about that one time that he had to dismantle a bomb that you know showed up in a package at their doorstep and then in terms of when they started asking her about timing and where Fritz was at the time that the the three were murdered she tells the detectives that Fritz had been on a camping trip with a young man named Ian Perkins who was a 21 year old college student who had been friends with Fritz and the family for lots of years and this is where it all starts to fall apart Mm -hmm. they go to ian 21 year old college kid and they start to question him put the pressure on him he reveals to them that he had been told by fritz that fritz is a cia operative Fritz has been acting like a mentor to him. This kid wanted to be in intelligence. So over time, Fritz has been mentoring him. I'm in the CIA. I'll help you get your foot in the door. You can help me with a secret mission I've got coming up. And they reveal to this kid that he had not actually been doing what Fritz told him. Fritz said to him that he was going to assist him on a secret covert operation to take out some communist drug smugglers. Although Ian, the boy, was not going to have to be involved in the killing. All he was going to do was help establish the cover and be a driver. And these investigators tell this kid, you were part of assisting him in murdering Bob. Family members. And, yeah, Bob and, and yeah, exactly. This kid is devastated. He is crying. He cannot believe it. And he immediately agrees to help them. They get this boy set up to go have conversations with Fritz wearing a wire. Yeah. And which is a life threatening thing. Yes. I mean definitely. Yes. That he does it twice. He's he's very willing to help them. He feels terrible. And the last time they say, We need more. You've got to really push Fritz. They gave him this story to say to make it seem as though the investigators were onto him, that they were onto what was going on. They wanted to scare Fritz and they wanted him to try to get him to confess yeah. to something. So Ian does it and he tells Fritz, you know, I'm afraid they're gonna come after me. And so here is a little quote. They're having this conversation sitting in the blazer of Fritz's car. 
car and it's working. Ian is telling them he has a paper and he's like, they're calling me in. They're getting, they believe this about you. And Fritz is getting concerned. And so according to Jerry Bledsoe's article, the last thing Fritz says to Ian is, quote, I'll write a paper saying you were not knowingly involved, that you believed you were on a covert mission for the government. I've got things to do. I won't see you again. They get out of the car. What Ian would not know until later was that where he had been sitting in that car, there was a bomb. Oh gosh, I was just, I I just was thinking you talked about a bomb in the start, in the start of this story. And we have not seen that bomb yet. Mm -hmm. Did he blow that kid up? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna get to this in a minute. Okay. So (sighs) the investigators were watching this, of course, like this whole thing, they're, they're monitoring all of it. And they are like, oh my gosh, based on what just happened, we now think that Fritz is either going to make a run for it or he might be looking to commit suicide. And if he if he made a run for it, no, no matter what's, they're, they're afraid somebody's going to get hurt regardless, yeah. you know? So the, he's heading back towards his home. They stop at a payphone, again, no cell phones, and they get authorization on a payphone from the DA to arrest Fritz. But they know that this can be really tricky because they know how armed he is they know he's got everything he's got weapons he's got everything they get to the house and they're trying to come up with their plan they want to lure him out they want to get him by himself but as they're watching his apartment they see Susie and Fritz throwing things into the blazer including duffel bags and what look to be three automatic weapons and then they see the boys walk out no it's during the school day they think the boys are at school Susie didn't send the boys to school so they see the boys climb into the back seat with the dogs the police cars are starting to follow the blazer and and they, they start to try to stop it. And at one point, they angle a car sideways in front of it. And Fritz, I know, Fritz drives around it. And But they're, they're pursuing other, other agencies are getting involved. More cars are coming. And try, they're trying to get Fritz boxed in. Yes. And so it, I know, I know. And at one point, Fritz pulls out an Uzi. Oh, my God. And he starts to shoot at the officers. Some of the officers shoot back. A police sergeant named Tommy Dennis saw Fritz smile at him as he aimed this gun at Tommy Dennis, this sergeant, and he was shot three times by Fritz, but he had worn his bulletproof vest oh. that day, which saved his life, although it, it the impact was so strong that it still like tore up skin mm. underneath his vest mm-hmm. and put him in shock. So an ambulance came to treat him. Another man, actually a Kentucky detective who had come up, two detectives from Kentucky were actually here at this time trying to like see what they could figure out with the Lynch case and they ended up in the middle of this chase as well so one of them was hit under the pit of his arm I actually know his niece oh yeah this was this was a detective I I know his niece but he was okay in fact at first before he wanted treatment he continued the chase and ultimately had to go back and get treatment but but the chase continues this one detective I'm mentioning though the one from Kentucky he would later tell Jerry Bledsoe that as the shots were happening as Fritz was firing at towards him that he caught a glimpse of Susie's face and that he was struck by the quote blank unconcerned look on her face is Fritz driving and Fritz, shooting Fritz is driving yeah and he, had, he had paused and kind of like ah uh, opened that you know through the open window just okay. started shooting yes so Fritz continues driving and the others are kind of giving some space as a detective later said when somebody is shooting a machine gun at you you have to give a little space but you have it's just people coming from everywhere you've got kind of a caravan of people following the blazer and then you've got people trying to get ahead of them to try to orchestrate a roadblock and then other units are kind of coming in from different areas and at least I don't even know how many times Fritz opened fire but at least once more and I believe it was more than that but no other officers were hit but then as the officers are trailing and watching suddenly there was a burst of fire Mm. from beneath the blazer and then it exploded and when it did it sent the vehicle literally into the air about the height of the telephone wires before it came crashing back down and it skidded into a ditch they said there was smoke everywhere and then of course they had to wait you know you had to to wait for a few minutes to make sure that nobody was going to come out shooting but then the as the detective started to go in you know towards the wreckage they found Fritz he had been thrown 100 feet from the car he was lying face down but he was still breathing one of the detectives tried to get him to speak hoping for a confession but he didn't and when when he they turned him over on his back after a minute or two he started gurgling and he died mm. um, they said he drowned in his own blood he was Ugh. 32 mm. Susie who was 38 had also been thrown 
thrown from the car, was clearly dead. She was sitting on that seat. Ian had been just just a while before. They believed the bomb was under that seat. Mm-hmm. And so she was pretty mangled from the waist down. Part of one leg was missing. Mm. And then they went to the back seat and they found the two boys. John was 10, Jim was nine, and they had a dog between them. I can't. I'm like shaking. It gets worse, actually. Um, uh. Because an autopsy would later reveal that the boys had been poisoned with cyanide. And then the cyanide had not yet killed them. They had been shot in the head before the explosion occurred. They were already dead before the explosion? Yeah. Oh my gosh. One of the articles said a 9 millimeter pistol handgun found, was found next to a telephone pole and you know after the explosion and they later determined that was the weapon used to shoot the kids. The Susie's family would later try to insist that you know Susie would never have allowed her children to be murdered in front of her if we're assuming that Fritz did it but her autopsy determined that it was the explosion that killed her and there are many people who think that Susie was the one who fired the shots. Mm. In the apartment that he shared with Susie, Fritz left four notes. He did leave the note he had promised Ian. It said that that Ian had participated in no wrongdoings of any kind, and then it added, quote, he was with me on a camping trip to Peaks of Otter on the weekend of May 18th, and to the best of his certain knowledge, in training for a possible career in covert operations. His other notes, one declared his innocence, one was stating to whom different items belonged, and the last one said, quote, mother, I love you now and always, your Fritz. So Ian Perkins was the only individual who was ever charged in relation to the Winston-Salem murders. He was found guilty, and he served four months for being an accessory after the fact. It would have been a lot more, but the judge offered leniency because mm-hmm. he had risked his life mm-hmm. talking to Fritz and mm-hmm. trying to trying to make things right mm-hmm. as best he could. And they, the Kentucky detectives continued to try to bring closure to the Lynch case, which was something that Tom appreciated. This is one person's opinion, but the Kentucky State Police Lieutenant Dan Davidson, who was very heavily involved in the investigation of the murders, he was quoted as saying in 1999, there's no doubt in my mind, Susie is the most evil woman I ever heard of in my life. Fritz was following her lead. That's what I feel about it. Mm-hmm. I think so too. Yeah. And then with Tom. Now, the last thing I could find, the most recent, was 2015. He, at that time, was married to a third wife, Kelly, and he had a daughter with her. Mm. This daughter today would be 21 because she was 13 at the time of that article being written, and he was sharing his feelings. I'm assuming he's still the same way today, but at that time, he was expressing a lot of bitterness about Mm. the way the custody battle was handled, his limited visitation rights. He felt that Susie's aunt used her power and influence to limit his time with his kids and that if he'd been more present, then he might have been able to Mm -hmm. save them. Mm -hmm. And he is very critical of the way the police handled the situation with Fritz because he felt like the boy's deaths could have been prevented if they'd handled it differently. Yeah. Just to kind of finish this out again Jerry Bledsoe wrote that long series not long after a horrific tragedy occurred where the, the explosion happened and then it turned into the book and then the movie came out it was a 1994 made for TV miniseries called In the Best of Families Marriage Pride and Madness mm. and it starred Kelly McGillis Harry Hamlin and Keith Carradine and one of the comments that they made was that I'm just going to read this quote straight from the source because they said it better than I could. The Klenner Lynch case had so many unbelievable twists and turns that CBS, the network that aired the movie, didn't want to accept reality. In the film, Fritz and Susie don't shoot or poison the boys. The TV people felt the public would be turned off by such a cruel act. Jerry Bledsoe, on whose book the movie was based, argued in vain with CBS to stick to the facts, but he can understand why some find Susie and Fritz's grim doings so hard to digest. Yes. So that's the end of that story. Oh my gosh. I know. I mean, horrific. Yeah. Such a tragedy, but it's it's also like you you can't you can't even wrap your head around no. it. Yeah, and to think that this all happened, like, in our backyards. It Part of me wonders why they didn't go after Tom, but then the other part of me realizes that she went after Tom in the worst possible way, which was to kill everyone that he loved. You, you know, you would think, well, Tom is the problem. Why are they not targeting him? 
what I saw in a couple of different articles was the inference people made was that he would have been next. That uh, had everything not been brought to a head, yeah. had they not been forced to make yeah. a run for it, Tom would have been next. Next, in line. yeah, yeah. Everybody. He was just too far away, maybe. Yes, and also I think I think there was some. This is just my Candy's opinion, but I think there was some reaction. They obviously I think planned way ahead on certain things, but it would usually be precipitated. Like Bob is going to testify in this right, hearing. Right. Therefore, now we've got to do this. Right. And I do believe Tom would have been next if they'd gotten away with these other things. Yeah. Other speculation, what a lot of people believe is that Susie was present when Dolores and Janie were killed. Mm. That is something that a lot of people think. There was a car that was seen turning around. A lot of people think she was the driver that he hid in the woods and waited and then shot Dolores when she was at the door and then went in the house. And mm-hmm. that's probably didn't think Janie was going to be there. That was probably a mm-hmm. bit of a surprise mm-hmm. and something alerted them that she was home. Mm-hmm. And then he went after her. This is just speculation. Right. Obviously, Susie was not involved with her parents but that's because he had ian he had duped ian into helping him Mm -hmm. so that's that's i don't know i I don't know that Susie wasn't involved with her parents because that what you said with her mother where it was so personal Mm -hmm. fritz didn't have any personal issues uh, unless Susie told him Susie's the one that had the fight with her mother about you two can't be together. And then that just, to me, feels like something that Susie would have done. You mean actually being involved in the murder yes. process? Yes. Um, well, I think if I recall correctly, she was busy or she, no, she wasn't with the boys. The boys were with Tom, but she, I think, had an alibi. I don't think they think she was there. Really? However, back to your point, again, if you are interested in this case, you should read the book. It is so, it's just fascinating. So tragic, but it's fascinating. And so well written. And I've left out so much, obviously. But something that Jerry Bledsoe brought out in the book was it it kind of was personal for Fritz. Remember, mm. this is his aunt and uncle that he killed. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't have been related to Nana because that was on Bob's side. But he was the one who was in their house when they were disapproving of him mm. being there because okay. he was staying with Susie. He also felt that his family and his dad in particular, who I don't know if I made this clear enough, he hero worshipped his father. Yeah. He was obsessed with his father. He felt that the Sharps and the Newsoms looked down on his dad dad a little bit, that they were a little snooty and that they weren't as accepting of him and his father. And so I think he felt like he'd always been snubbed a little bit and not as accepted into the other part of the family. I think there was some bitterness. Plus, I mean, they were meddling in his business, you know, and and he was in love with Susie. Yeah, absolutely. Armchair psychologist. Obviously, we are two people who are mildly informed. <laughs> we, yes. we are not well-informed people, but just based on what you've heard, some of the controversy, some of the differing opinions, I would say, have been around Susie's level of involvement with the murders. You've already brought yeah. up the murders of her parents mm-hmm. and her grandmother, but also her kids. Her family were like, no, there's no way she was not involved. She wouldn't have let this happen. Other people think she absolutely was the one who gave them the cyanide mm-hmm. capsule because Fritz is driving and, and manning, mm-hmm. you know, an Uzi. Mm-hmm. So m- many people believe she gave the cyanide capsules and, and may have been the one who shot them. So mm-hmm. do you have an opinion? I think she probably was. I do. I think we already see that she's neglecting the kids. She's not bathing them. She's not. If the family is trying to hang on to she was a good mother, she would never. With respect to them, because we don't know them and they they need to believe what they need to believe. But their teeth were not taken care of. She was not obviously not taking care of them so her mothering instincts are not there and she put she put them around this crazy man Mm -hmm. and she put them in the car and she put the dog in the car and they knew what they were going to do so i and she wanted to hurt her husband if i'm going out so are they you know Mm -hmm. if they were sued the two of them are suicidal she didn't have to she could have left those kids in the house she could the two of them could have taken off but she didn't want that she Mm -hmm. sounds like a malignant narcissistic person who is entitled and spoiled and just was going to get her way or no way. I think she would rather they be gone than go to her ex-husband, Tom. Mm -hmm. So I could see that being her motivation. And just that if that one detective said she's the most evil person Mm -hmm. he's ever heard of, then yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that as well. I believe that the boys were 
pawns mm-hmm. in many ways. Mm-hmm. They were, I don't know, maybe this is not the right wording, but it was almost like they were a possession to mm-hmm. her more so than the love. It's more like I own them yes. and I control them and I can hurt you through yes. them. And and that's kind of how she stood. At one point she was quoted as telling people or someone that if anything ever happened to Fritz, they carried cyanide pills, she and Fritz. And she had told somebody that if anything ever happened to him, she and the boys were going to take those cyanide pills because she didn't want to be without him. Mm. Now that's just one quote that was mm-hmm. out there. And who knows, somebody could have made that up afterwards. Right. So I thought I would end by sharing this one quote I saw in one of the articles that kind of speaks to this question we've been talking about. Why didn't Susie and Fritz spare the boys? Why didn't they let them out of the blazer? One explanation became clear when police pieced the case together. Letting the boys live would have meant Tom Lynch would gain custody. Rather than allow that, Susie took the boys to the grave with her. That is the ultimate evil, says writer Bledsoe. To spite her husband, Susie killed the boys. Yep, I agree completely with him. Well... This was a, well, that was a terrible way to I end know, the month. So, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Candy, for making us all horribly sad. I'm now. so sorry. It's okay, but, but you can see yeah. how it's so hard to fathom that mm-hmm. you're fascinated by it. You're like, how could this have happened? How yeah. could it's, how can it's people so be unbelievable? That evil? Yes, yes. So, anyway, who are we going to cheers? I would say the victims. Poor Tom. I don't. I don't. I don't even want to raise a glass to him. Just like in sympathy and just sadness, and I'm so sorry and compassion, and I'm so sorry that this happened to you. Mm-hmm. If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can Join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music, Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reed, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the hosts during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.